بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم السلام على خير خلقه أجمعين نبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين Respected brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One of the habits of human beings throughout their lives is to conduct and to take part in conversations. Sometimes this happens over a meal. In other instances, it is a casual process of communication. Many a times people engage in ways in which they express their feelings towards the other and take part in some form of verbal communication which results in information being passed between the other or in, in certain instances asking about each other's well-being. So conversations between human beings are a normal practice in many shapes and forms. Interestingly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran tells us there have been a number of very crucial conversations between two beings. If you look at Surah Qaf, for instance, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes a conversation which happens on the Day of Judgment. It's a very intriguing aspect when the Quran discusses the afterlife, it sheds light on some crucial factors for us to keep into consideration and one of them is the communication that happens between certain beings on the day of reckoning the day of resurrection in surah qaf allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that whilst people are waiting to be held accountable for their actions in this life they would start to argue and dispute matters between themselves. In other words, there'll be some form of disagreement amongst people. In certain parts of the Quran, it gives us an idea of the groups of people involved in these types of discussions, heated exchanges. One of them is in Surah Qaf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that whilst they're standing to be held accountable, qala qarinuhu, رَبَّنَا مَا أَطْغَيْتُهُ وَلَكِنْ كَانَ فِي ضَلَالٍ بَعِيدٍ Now, the Quran tells us his friend, because in Arabic the word qareen refers to an intimate or a close associate. His companion will say, Oh Allah, it's not my fault. I did not mislead them. They themselves chose this path. Question. Who is it that's speaking? The majority of Mufassireen say, based on other verses in the Quran, this friend is whom? Shaitan. The reason why it's the Shaitan, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in other parts of the holy book says, وَمَنْ يَعْشُ عَنْ ذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَانِ نُقَيِّذْ لَهُ شَيْطَانًا فَهُوَ لَهُ قَرِينٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will appoint shaitan as a friend of whomsoever does not remember Allah. Very simple equation. Non-remembrance of God equals shaitan being a close associate, a friend. A being that's somehow establishes an affinity or a relationship with the individual. So the Quran says, on that day of reckoning, which is sometimes calculated at thousands of years, there'll be a discussion, there'll be a dialogue, there'll be a conversation between certain human beings and shaitan. And we do what we do often here, blame others. So we'll stand there, according to the Quran, and we'll say, oh Allah, it's not my fault, it's a shaitan's fault. Interestingly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in other parts, shaitan will respond and say, La talumuni walumu anfusakum. Don't blame me, blame yourselves. I did not make you do what you did. I just whispered and encouraged the performance of your action. What is intriguing in Surah Qaf, however, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in today's modern terminology, shuts them both up 
and says, لا تختصموا لدي اليوم How dare you, both of you, in other words, the human being and the shaitan, argue in front of me. وَقَدْ قَدَّمْتُ إِلَيْكُمْ بِالْوَعِيدِ I gave you so many signs that this is the promised destination or the place of abode. I sent you prophets. I gave you signs left, right and center. Yet you rejected. And now you're blaming each other? The shaitan saying it's not my fault and human being saying it's the shaitan's fault. مَا يُبَدَّلُ الْقَوْلُ لَدَيَّ وَمَا أَنَا بِظَلَّامٍ لِلْعَبِيدِ I'm not going to oppress anyone and my decree is final. Then there's another conversation in Surah Qaf. This is also quite interesting. Allah says, يَوْمَ نَقُولُ لِجَهَنَّمْ هَلِمْ تَلَأْتِي وَتَقُولُ هَلْ مِنْ مَزِيدٍ now Allah is speaking to Jahannam and Jahannam speaks back to Allah Jalla wa'ala. Another fascinating element of the Day of Judgment that the Almighty grants His creation the ability to speak. The limbs will speak, the angels will testify, the Quran will stand as a witness on the Day of Judgment. Likewise, Jahannam, according to this ayah, will speak. Now, you look at the books of many of our brothers uh, in other schools of thought, you look at, for instance, the Sahih compilations, you look at Musnad Ahmad ibn Hanbal, you look at Qurtabi, al durr al-Manthur, the famous book by Allama Hafiz Jalaluddin al-Suyuti. It has come to a point where they nearly, nearly majority of the Mufassireen outside the school of Ahl al-Bayt agree on this following point. They say this conversation between God and Jahannam is one that is related to Jahannam reacting when God, God forbid, places his feet and his legs inside it. So he places his legs inside Jahannam and would say, are you full? And Jahannam would say, is there any more? No, there's more space, you know. Of course, this is somehow anthropomorphism, this is the attribution of physical characteristics to God, which we reject categorically as the school of Ahl al-Bayt. We don't accept it under any circumstances. However, what we understand this ayah is, Allah says to Jahannam, are you full? Now, this could mean either to demonstrate the number of people that will be punished, that will be quite a few, to say, oh, look, it's not for God to know, for human beings to recognize. Or Jahannam to say that there is no limit, that the capacity for punishment is there. Or some of us have said it's not actually a conversation, but it's God saying it is as if, يَوْمَ نَقُولُ لِجَهَنَّمْ It is as if we say to Jahannam, is there any space? And it will say yes. But it's part of the number of very intriguing conversations that the Qur'an has presented for us surely for reflection and contemplation. Of course, the subject of our discussion is perhaps one of the most famous conversations that took place, that between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his chosen prophet Musa ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa alayhi afdalu salati wa salam. Now, of course, we reached the point in Surah Taha in our discussion regarding the most, one of the most controversial areas in the story, which is the murder or the killing of the copt by Musa alayhi salam. Now, this has caused a bit of a controversy in certain parts uh, of, of theological schools. We find that in verse 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَتَلْتَ nafsan," That you killed someone. How could that be? How can a prophet of God kill an individual in such a manner? The story, as we mentioned, is that Musa السلام, wanders off the palace that he was residing in and knows where Bani Israel are living. Uh, they didn't know that his father was Imran. So by the way, Bani Israel used to call him Musa ibn Fir'aun. They used to refer to him as the son of Fir'aun because all, for all they know, he was raised in the palace of Fir'aun. He comes across two people fighting. One is apparently the cook of Fir'aun, one of the perhaps several cooks of Fir'aun, and the other 
is a supporter or an individual who is of the Shia of Musa alayhi salam and in trying to separate them the cook or the copt is killed by Musa and the Quran sheds light on it in certain parts. So the Mukhatta'a, there's a school of thought known as Mukhatta'a, they are nearly extinct today and they are those who continuously subject the prophets to errors, mistakes and sins. They say yes, they've committed many uh, transgressions against God the Almighty. So what do they say? They say, well, look, this is one proof. The other proof that exists is in the ayah itself and, uh, and as well as in Surah Al-Qasas, وَقَتَلْتَ نَفْسًا that you have killed someone. And likewise, look, if you look at Surah Al-Qasas, chapter 28, verse 15, it highlights it in more detail where God the Almighty says, هَذَا قَالَ هَذَا مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ This is one of the acts of shaitan. So they say that's wrong. Secondly, قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي ظَلَمْتُ نَفْسِي That, O oh Lord, I've committed ظُلْم. And thirdly, فَغْفِرْ لِي Forgive me. So they say these three are evidence that Musa committed a sin. In the school of Ahlul Bayt, we believe no. All prophets are ma'soom, chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how do we respond? Well, one interpretation is this. Fir'aun used to persecute people and subject them to torment, punishment, and he was known to be a vicious leader. And therefore, one of those individuals who deserved to be killed was that man, that person who was fighting the Shi'i of Musa, the supporter of Musa. So the cook of Fir'aun somehow deserved because he had either killed several people or he had tortured many people. And because Musa is a prophet of God, he has the permission, just like Khidr did, to kill that individual. They say that slavery and imprisonment was strife and that the individual deserved to be punched by Musa because the, the Quran tells us فَوَكَزَهُ Musa. Wakza here, as you can see in Ayah 15, is a punch. Musa was quite physically built and so in doing so, that man died. And the other explanation that's given is that it seems that Musa was saving a life because the Ayah says فَوَجَدَ فِيهَا رَجُلَيْنِ يَقْتَتِلَانِ Yaqtatilan means what? They weren't just fighting. They were about to kill each other. So, Musa saw that without killing that individual, this innocent man will be killed. So he had to do it. That's one interpretation. We say that Musa had really no choice to, ser to, to, to save that Shi'i of his. فَاسْتَغَاثَهُ الَّذِي مِنْ شِيْعَتِهِ Istighatha means help because I'm about to die. It, it, it denotes extreme suffering. That's one group of Mufassirin. Others say no. Musa did not want to kill. That was not his intention. All that he wanted to do was to separate them. But it so happened because of his strength, by separating them, one, the, the, the copt fell and died. So it wasn't a conscious deliberate action by Moses to kill that individual. It was something that he rushed towards doing, didn't really necessarily reflect a, a lot about, and that's why it is referred to as tarke awla. What's tarke awla? Leaving that which is desirable. What was desirable for Musa to do was to know that by, by interfering, there's a possibility that one of them may die, and certainly the, ones, the one who he's attacking, Therefore, perhaps the way he would approach it would be different. But it does not constitute a sin because you did not wish to kill anybody, but that individual ended up dying because of the circumstances. That's one, the other way of looking at it. Now we have a problem, which is, okay, you have come across two possibilities of why Musa acted in such a way, but how can you explain all these words that somehow denote that he committed a sin? So the first point is I know this is a slightly technical, but we are, we are subjected as a school of Ahlul Bayt always to 
uh, understand the Quran not at the superficial level. Yes, this is from the actions of Shaitan. What does Musa mean when he says "Hada min amal shaitan He doesn't say this killing is from the acts of Shaitan. He says this feud, this anger between them, the fighting between them is from the work of Shaitan. So when he when when he finishes, when everything finishes, and that man is 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 no longer alive, Musa is saying, what caused this? At the outset, is shaitan bringing them together and creating enmity between them. And, uh, He is a manifest enemy who tries to deceive and deviate people. Okay, number one. Number two, nafsi. People say, oh, zulm, oppression equals sin. No. Of course, in Arabic, zulm is when you place something not in its original location where it's supposed to go is dhulm and it has been translated to mean oppression in modern day or in the terminology that people utilize with regards to sin but it's originally it means no when you don't do what you're supposed to do and musa was supposed to separate them without necessarily killing someone and that, as we mentioned, was tarka awlad, doing that which was, leaving that which was desirable. And therefore, this zulm does not necessarily constitute a sin because he did not do what he is supposed to do. do, to do. And uh, the other evidence that they present is, he says, qala rabbi inni zalamtu nafsi. It's very important you pay attention to this. He doesn't say, qala rabbi inni zalamtu rabbi. He says, I have wronged myself, not wronged my Lord. If it was a murder, it must be what? Wrong, wronging my Lord. Because Allah says, you can't kill anyone unjustly. He says, I've wronged myself. It means the choice that I should have taken, I didn't take. Therefore, it was hasty to get into this and to separate them in such strength, resulting in one of them dying. Final problem is, فغفر لي. Ghufran today is understood to be what? Forgiveness. Wrong. In Arabic, it doesn't mean forgiveness. It means to conceal, to hide, to protect. So, Musa says to Allah, Oh Allah, I want this action to be protected, preserved from being somehow the subject of attack against Musa salam, Or one that will come back to haunt him in many shapes and forms. So, uh, we have in other verses in the Quran that we have spoken about, such as in chapter 48, Inna laka laka ma ta Allah says to the Prophet, I am doing maghfira of your past and future dhanb. This is, doesn't mean the Prophet had past and future sins that God is forgiving. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, the perception of others about you, that's what dhanb is, I am protecting and I'm giving them an image of you which is better than what they initially had in their minds. So, the word ghufran here has nothing to do with necessarily sin. It is later being applied to forgiveness of the sin, but it's in reality in the Arabic language refers to what refers to protection. And if we go back to Surah Taha, we understand how this is applicable because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَتَلْتَ نَفْسًا فَنَجَّيْنَاكَ مِنَ الْغَمْ وَفَتَنَّاكَ فُتُونَ We saved you. This نَجَّيْنَاكَ مِنَ الْغَمْ means we saved you from calamities, we saved you from hardship, we saved you from the disastrous consequences that would normally happen if you were to kill someone. So therefore, you have indeed been protected and so some people might ask the question this is uh, too much we're going too much into detail to try and exonerate and protect the prophet of god from sinning well this is the aqidah of the school of ahl al-bayt we don't believe any prophet committed any sin small or big accidental or deliberate and every verse in the quran that questions this we have to find ways to explain it not by own way 
by, from the hadith of the Ahl al-Bayt and other verses in the Quran. Verses in the Quran quite clearly exonerate the prophets and say, they say that they are on the Surat al-Mustaqeem. God has chosen them. They are from the Mukhlasin. Now, it's interesting that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, Musa, after this, we made you go through a number of trials and tribulations. وَفَتَنَّاكَ Futuna. We made you go through some form of test and examination. Uh, the tests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subjects human beings, they could either be positive or negative. People might think, but they're normally negative. No. Allah wa ta'ala says that this fitna could sometimes come in the form of something that brings happiness to the hearts of human beings. It's not always as we perceive it to be doom and gloom as to I am being tested and why am I going through this hardship. That's why Al-Raghib al-Isfahani, who is the uh, famous uh, linguist, Arab linguist, he says that fitna is when you place comes from fatan. Fatan is when you place gold in fire to test if it's truly gold, to establish its authenticity. When you put it in some heat or in a flame to distinguish it from a fake one, yeah? And of course, this beautifully presents to us why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen this word in order for us to discover our strengths, to be able to see where, how our potential can extend. And therefore, we go through good times and we go through difficult times. And they're both part of God's examination. Let's switch it again. Um, that's why the Quran says, When ablukum bisharri wal khayri fitna, I will test you with good and bad. Sharr and khair. Both will be considered what? A source of calamity or a source of examination, trial and hardship. You know, I remember uh, an individual only last week sent me a, a message saying, you know, I, I got married, then I divorced. Then I got married, then I divorced. And now I'm married and I'm thinking of divorce. Why is God testing me like this? You know, or you find the people who say, I'm trying to get married, but I can't. Or you find the people say that I'm, I failed my driving test 20 times, you know. And each and every person comes forward with their own way. And deep down, of course, they're distressed about it. They feel very unhappy to have to go through for them this form of unease. Uh, dislike of what hap what is that they're being affected with or uh, what is going through in their lives and I always give this example that if today you and I were about to go and purchase from the local supermarket or whatever or if we're presented here with some tea bags and if these tea bags we have no idea where they've come from which brand they're from which type of tea they produce is it green tea you know all these different types of teas out there today you know or the standard black tea and if I was to hold it and say from looking at it can you tell which one it is if you can then you have a special ability normally people can't what is the only way of knowing what kind of tea it is by placing it in hot water and for us to know our strengths and weakness, we have to go through hot water. Allah knows. He knows. We don't know. And the successful individual is the one who goes through all this and is able to become a better human being afterwards. To learn from the hardship that they've gone through. To transform their lives to the better because they know God knows their suffering. No one suffers in silence. You know this famous statement, we suffer in silence. The voice for the voiceless, you know, all that, you can hear that. But nobody in reality suffers in silence because God is aware. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows before us. 
He knows our extent and our limitations and how much we can deal with. And so Quran tells us that Musa السلام, went through hardship like every prophet did, like all the imams did. What kind of hardship? Here was a man who was raised all his life in a so-called luxurious environment, in the palace. Now he finds himself with a shepherd, albeit he's a prophet, yes, and having to work for 10 years, earn his living, and getting there was also a big challenge for Musa السلام. But Allah wa ta'ala says, that was your test. وَفَتَنَّاكَ فُتُونَا فَلَبِثْتَ سِنِينَ فِي أَهْلِ مَدْيًا ثم جئت على قدر يا موسى. You spent these years in the area or the city of Madian, the city of Prophet Shu'aib alayhi salam. And we planned this for you, O Musa. Allah says, I have specifically chosen this path for you, O Musa. Maybe you're not aware of it, but this is part of God's plan. How many of us could say the same thing about our lives? How many of us have chosen certain directions in our lives, but all of a sudden things have changed? And we think, we don't know why. It was God's plan. And always, always, no exception, God's plan is good. Overall picture, it's good. It's much better than good. It's very good. But it's, of course, how we perceive it and how we utilize what he has planned for us. Now, he says, Ya Musa, once again for tashrif, to refer back to Musa in, in these so many instances, وَاسْطَنَعْتُكَ لِنَفْسِي Verse number 41. Beautiful way to conclude the favors that he has given to this Prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have made you for myself. Now, what does that actually mean? It's interesting because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that all of his creation are being created to worship him. And that here, it is quite specific to Mo Moses alayhi salam. He says, وَاسْتَنَعْتُ كَلِنَفْسِي Two opinions are presented. One is that istina' comes from Emphasis. Al istina, al raghib says, al israr al akid ala islah shay. It is emphasis upon a particular matter. Now, it is suggested that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have made you for myself because I ordained that you are an individual who will go through what you went through in order to fulfill the mission, which is what? for the salvation of mankind, which involves the worship of God. It's not a personal thing. وَاسْطَنَعْتُكَ لِنَفْسِي means لِنَفْسِيهِ It doesn't mean for the divine essence. It means for the mission of the divine essence, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is to establish monotheism and tawheed. Others say, no, istina' comes from ihsan. Ihsan means what? To do good for a particular individual. Allah says, I have done so much good for you for my sake. Why? Because I have selected you. I have chosen you. This ihsan comes from the, uh, comes from the concept of istikhlas. Istikhlas is not the same as ikhlas. Ikhlas means sincerity. Istikhlas means purification and specific selection. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there are people who I have chosen. And these individuals, the shaitan cannot get close to. And due to my favor upon them, I have given them my bounties and I've bestowed upon them my mercy. وَاسْطَنَعْتُكَ لِنَفْسِي I'm choosing you and selecting you for this purpose. That's why in Surah Maryam, verse 51, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ مُوسَىٰ إِنَّهُ كَانَ مُخْلَصَىٰ There's a difference between مُخْلِص, مُخْلِص is sincere, مُخْلَص with a fatha on the lam means chosen, purified. Now, there's no doubt 
that ikhlas leads to istikhlas. Sincerity leads to specific selection of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. And people say, okay, why didn't God choose me? Why did he choose Musa? Why did he choose the Holy Prophet? Why did he choose Imam Sadaq alayhi salam? Why did he choose these, these two individuals? Can he choose us? But he says in the Quran, the door is still open. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, in tansuru allaha yansurukum wa yuthabbit aqdamakum. O you who believe, you give victory to the cause of God, he will give victory to you. You're with God, he'll be with you. So the choice and the option is still there, not of course for a prophet or an imam, but for an individual who can be chosen by God for other tasks, for other stations, for other objectives, to be the tool for the propaga propagation and the spreading of the message. Now, here the Quran tells us Musa alayhi salam has been chosen because of what? The hadith tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Musa, he said, oh Musa, do you know why I chose you? And Musa says, no, O oh Lord. He says, because I looked around, and when Allah says I looked around, doesn't mean he looked around. It means out of all of my creation, you were the most humble. You displayed the most humility, and hence I chose you. You are the one who would place your cheeks onto the ground in humility, in tawadu, and hence you are chosen. You all, it's all hand in hand. It all indeed comes together as important qualities that the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala wants in his chosen servants. Now, اذهب أنت وأخوك بآياتي Now, you and your brother go. If you remember, Many, many weeks back, we discussed this ayah, this one. اِذْهَبْ إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّهُ طَغَىٰ This should make you think now. Hold on a minute. A few minutes ago, Allah says to Musa, go to Fir'aun. He has transgressed. Now, he says to him what? He says, اِذْهَبْ أَنْتَ وأخوك. You and your brother now go. So people here have posed the question, hold on, didn't God know before that Harun is going to be accompanying Musa and Musa is going to ask for a supporter in the shape and the form of Harun? So why did he at the beginning say, you go by yourself? Now he's saying, you and your brother go to Fir'aun. Well, it's quite clear in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that I have listened to Musa's request. If initially he had said, you and your brother go, doesn't leave much for Musa to ask. Here, it's a demonstration of God's mercy. That look, Musa, initially I said, you go. But now you've said to me, you want Harun. Of course, I've agreed. That's why both of you go. It is part of God's demonstration of the fact that he listens and grants people's requests. Now, ayati here means my signs. Of course, the two signs that were shown to Musa are important. However, ayati is plural. Plural means there are more than two. So, Alama Taba Taba'i here in Tafsir al-Mizan, he says, this is an indication to Musa, oh Musa, you and your brother go to Fir'aun, with my signs, not only the two that I've showed you, but I'm going to give you more. Well, the reassurance for Musa that you are go going to see many other phenomenal miracles and signs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The locusts and the, uh, the river turning red and the, obviously the river Nile or the sea splitting. Yes? as well as, of course, the magic of the magicians being defeated before everyone. All these, Quran doesn't tell us that Allah said to Musa, you will see them. However, it says, I will give you signs. Don't worry, you go. Wala taniya fi dhikri. 
don't hesitate in my remembrance. Don't think twice about mentioning me. When I was reflecting on this verse a while back, one thought came to my mind. Sometimes when it comes to our faith, when it comes to practice, when we're in surroundings which we don't feel comfortable expressing our faith, we'd like to conceal it. I've seen in offices, Alhamdulillah, I've worked many years in pharmacy and other places. You get a phone call and somebody says on the other line, Salaam Alaikum. You're around people, you don't want to really say Wa Alaikum Salaam. Oh, how are you? In response. Because you don't feel, you know, to respond by saying Alaikum Salaam. People say, what is he talking about? What is it that he's speaking? So there is that lack of confidence. Or for instance, when it comes to prayers, performing a prayers, as an example, you are in a in the winter, uh, you have perhaps four hours for Dhuhr and Asr, you're out shopping, the shopping center doesn't have a prayer room, you're stuck because you're quite far, there's no mosque close by, so you're thinking, okay, I need to pray, where should I pray? Parking lot, somewhere in the multi-story car park, I need to pray somewhere. Now there are some people who say, but people will look at me, people will judge me, people will look down upon me, yes? Allah says, don't hesitate when it's to do with anything related to God. Don't hesitate. Be strong. The Quran tells us in chapter 3, verse 160, فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Once you make that determination, go for it. And this is a beautiful, inspirational direction for all of us in life. You know, sometimes we think, you know what, I want to do this project for the sake of God. Or I want to help someone for the sake of God. I want to write this book or design this website or initiate this school or become a teacher or take part in a Islamic satellite channel or do something or donate. And then you have the hesitation. Quran tells us that hesitation is from shaitan. Categorically. The Raishis tell us when you want to donate, shaitan clings onto your hands and makes it heavy. Heavy in the sense that you don't want to pick up your hands and take out from the pocket or write that check or whatever it is. Yes? That hesitation. Do you remember last week we said that Allah says to Moses' uh, mother, throw him in the Nile. Don't place him. The word that is used in the Quran is aqdhifi. Qadhif doesn't mean ij'ali. Ij'ali means place him. Aqdhifi means quickly. No hesitation. Do it with determination, not thinking about it for like a week and pondering and going back and forth because then you'll get ideas and perhaps your resolve will get weaker. So determination here is of the utmost importance. Never, Quran says, when it says to Musa and Harun, when you go to Fir'aun, remember me and don't hesitate to mention things about me. When we're sitting with our friends, when we're talking to our non-Muslim colleagues, do we hesitate when it comes to talking about Islam, God, faith, belief, our practices? Allah says, don't hesitate. The moment you make that difficult step, and yes, I agree, it's hard. It's not easy. Because sometimes you may lose friends. People say, you're boring. You talk about religion. Well, then, you know, you shouldn't talk about anything else. But in certain instances or in conversations, you feel, it's not necessary or I'm not confident enough. Allah says, don't hesitate. Make that decision. Trust in God and see the difference. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly bestows that courage and encouragement to keep his remembrance alive. I'm not sure if I've mentioned this before. And apologies if I have. We've had a few, alhamdulillah, sessions. But one interesting idea that emerges from this verse is sales. You know, if today we're passing by a shop which says closing down sale, yeah? Nine times out of ten, we're thinking, all right, I'm going to stop. Or if it's certainly a place or a shop that we'd like to shop from or has good quality products, and also, what we would do is rush to the famous worldwide phenomena of communication known as WhatsApp and tell our friends or our family members, by the way, you better check this out. This place, 
I've been to it or I've gone to it or it's going to have a 50%, 70% clear out. Make sure you... Or if you find a, a deal online, something which is really uh, sought after or wanted and it's a very, very good price and it's only a limited period of time, you have the tendency to tell others about it, isn't it? You want to inform others because people say to you, thank you, you feel good. Someone's bought that item 70% off the original price. You feel good. Well, sometimes you don't want to tell people because you don't, you'd be the only one to have it. But normally, you would like to share with at least your family members and close friends. Yes. Now, imagine on the Day of Judgment, there's a, a line, a queue of people waiting to enter Jannah. And then there'll be another one, God forbid, of those wanting to or not wanting to but being dragged into Jahannam. Now imagine you're standing and inshallah we're on the ones going to Jannah. You look, ah, there's a friend of mine who I'd WhatsApped about that sale, but I never bothered to WhatsApp about faith. And they'd look and say, you told me about that worldly commodity, but you never told me to join this line. Why didn't you? You were God's agent and a tool for hidayah and da'wah. But he didn't take that responsibility or he didn't make that effort at least to direct me. Because it's all about hujjah. It's all about proof. Showing an individual, look, I've done what I can. And Allah says on the Day of Judgment, look, you had an opportunity and you rejected it. But without these opportunities, people will say to Allah, no one told me. All I heard was negativity. All I could hear or see is violence and bloodshed about Muslims and Islam. So Allah says, don't hesitate and go for the challenge with the remembrance of God the Almighty. Now both of you go to Fir'aun as an emphasis of the responsibility and what are you about to achieve. Now, you go to Fir'aun, don't expect Fir'aun to come to you. Individuals who wish to change society for the better, starting with themselves, need to seize opportunities and not wait for it to knock on their doors. Allah says, both of you go to Pharaoh because he's transgressed. Don't expect people come to come to you. Oh, but why, why are they not seeking the truth? A lot of people are waiting for the truth to come to them. Yes? And so Allah says, if you want to be of the righteous, use the opportunity at your disposal and go to people. Invite people. Deliver the message to people. And don't wait. Just like how Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi, says that the Prophet of Islam was what? He was a physician who used to go to people to heal them, not the other way around. You normally go to the doctor, make an appointment. It's how hard it is sometimes in this country to see a GP, right? What happens? Imam Ali alayhi salam no, says the Prophet used to himself go to people in order to heal them and to give them that guidance. But Allah says, when you go to Fir'aun, you have to have a powerful tool. And this next verse is arguably one of the most important when it comes to modern day communication and the perception of Muslims and Islam in the West. Allah says, you are about to go to a man who claims to be God. You are about to go to someone who is killed arguably thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, slaughtered children, enslaved perhaps millions, or at least hundreds of thousands. The epitome of arrogance and self-centeredness. You are going to go to a man whom God calls my enemy. He says to Musa, Aduwun li wa aduwun lak, earlier in Surah Taha, yes? All this, but you go to him and speak nicely to him. Amazing. All this. Be flexible. Be gentle. Be kind. 
Be soft. Every time an individual reflects on this ayah and the tool that Allah has given Musa and Harun, he says, you go to this man, but don't go all guns blazing and say, you're a kafir, you're a mushrik, you're in Jahannam. I can't believe you're not Muslim. And this is one of the most powerful responses to the crazy, bloodthirsty, terrorist machine that animals are better than them, and that's Daesh or ISIS. Yes? That their terminology, their hatred, their venom. Can you imagine someone worse than Fir'aun? I mean, Allah is saying, look, this is a man who's reached this level of oppression and injustice that perhaps many other human beings would never reach. Yet even despite all that, Allah says you must equip yourself with tolerance, with respect, and with what? With kindness. Go to him with a soft tone. Speak to him gently. I remember I watched a video clip recently of an individual in the Middle East being interviewed in one of the satellite channels. Unfortunately, the one, the individual who's being interviewed uh, subscribes to this ideology of hatred and takfir and, and uh, rejecting others and, and placing these derogatory terms against people. So the person interviewing him said, look, I don't agree with you. Would you kill me? Would you actually kill me? And the person looked at him and said, yes, I would first ask you to do Tawbah. If not, I'd have to kill you. He said, you're sitting right in front of me and I'm asking you in an interview and you would actually kill me if you had a knife. He said, yes, I have a choice. I'll have to ask you to do Tawbah from your disbelief of yours. But if you don't, I have to kill you. And that man didn't know what to say. He's sitting right next to him and he wants to kill him. Thank God not on television, perhaps somewhere else. You know? And you know, sometimes, unless you experience this yourself, you might not actually understand the severity of what we're dealing with. Just to end, that I was in the pilgrimage, the blessed pilgrimage of Hajj, and I picked up, or I, I was picked up by a taxi who was taking me to an area known as Aziziyah in Mecca. And he asked me, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Iraq. As soon as I said that, he said, you must be a Shia. I said, I'm proud of it. He said, you're in hell. I said, thank you. He said, you're this, this and that. I said, look, let's discuss what's the problem. What do you have this, this? I started to challenge some of his misconceptions that he had in his mind. You worship a different God. You have a different Quran. You, have a, uh, you, you don't do the Hajj to Mecca. You do it to Karbala. I said, what am I doing here then? And all these kind of things, you know. But what was shocking was what followed. He said, shall I tell you about myself? I said, yeah, go ahead. On this very busy night in Mecca where there's traffic, we were in a standstill. He said, last year I was in Iraq. I said, really? What were you doing there? He said, I went to kill Shias. I went to kill Shias. I said, so what happened to you? He said, I was about to go and perform this suicide bombing. I was caught. I escaped from prison. I was let out from prison. I came back to the country. And now I'm working as a taxi driver. And I'm looking at him thinking, you would kill me if you have the option. Because that's what you were about to do last year. I could have happened to be there. Or my brothers and sisters would have been there. Yes? Now, these individuals are as far away from the Quran and these beautiful verses that anyone could ever be. They have not pondered over the beautiful teachings of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala that espouses and propagates tolerance, coexistence, respect with the other with, and, and the people whom we necessarily do not agree with. And inshallah ta'ala, we'll discuss this element in more detail next time. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallillahum ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.